So I don't require any much time as our chairman has asked me to conclude in 10-12 minutes. So Mabala, you remember the connection with Bara and Sardarji. <laughs> so he is very closely related to Sikh gentlemen there in Delhi and here in Hyderabad also. <coughs> I congratulate Jana Professor Fajan Mustafa Sahab and other colleagues who organized this seminar on religion. I deeply appreciate the gesture of, to provide us with an opportunity to discuss the importance of religion through this subject. Secularism is a widely misinterpreted and misunderstood word. It does not question the pretensions of, pretensions of religion over human life. It rather promotes and advances the concept of ethical values prescribed by different religions. <coughs> Coming to Sikhism, let us clarify, Sikhism is not a religion, deen or dharma type of composition such as Semitic religions or Indian religions. It is a school of thought. Sikh means a disciple, learner. It came into existence when it was observed that the force of religion which has tremendous potential to influence was being misused by the clergies as a force for evil by exploiting and creating conflicts and divisions in human society. Sikhism is a movement to develop and promote cordial relations between the religions for purposeful and sustainable growth of humanism. Initiated by Guru Nanak Sahib, was consolidated by nine successors gurus during a period of 239 years. He spent about 40 years traveling about 40,000 miles, interacting with Muslim and Hindus, visiting their learning centers and places of pilgrimages. He thoroughly studied their books, holy books, and keenly observed them indulging in rituals, forgetting its true essence. These dialogues are pre preserved in the holy book of Sri Guru Garansa. During his Udasis, that is journeys, he went to the snow-covered Himalayan mountains and had a dialogue with the saints and sages who were meditating there for many years. He posed a question to them, what for you are sitting here when the society is burning on fire? They asked Guru Sahib, you seem to be a young boy, where from you got so much of learning and who is your guru, mentor? Guru Sahib replied, word is, word, the knowledge is my guru and my concentration is the disciple. To continue his mission, he did not perform any miracles but convinced people with reasoning and dialogue. That is how the prophethood of succession of the guruship of Sri Guru Gobind Singh Ji was bestowed to this holy book Shri Guru Granth Sahib. This is a multilingual and multi-religious holy book seated on a high pedestal in every Guru Dwara that is Sikh places of worship as a Guru that is a living mentor. This holy book and the teachings of Sikhism does not endorse the claim that any single religious tradition has a monopoly and treat all religions and their holy books as sacred and valid as different paths to approach God. The belief of Sikhism are articulated in the sacred holy book of Sri Guru Granth Sahib which includes faith and meditation on the name of lone creator, unity and equality of humankind engaging in self-service 
strive, striving for social justice, for benefit of prosperity of the society, honest, con, honest conduct and livelihood, which living a while living a harmonious life, and liberty of freedom for faith. It also preaches to stand up to protect religiously and socially oppressed peasants from priests and the state. It even advocates sacrificing of life and if necessary to confront with weapons to achieve these objectives. This was not possible unless qualities of embodiment of Sant Sipai, a saint soldier, are being incorporated in the fundamentals of this faith. The peculiarity of this faith is that it is just an ideology to practice in life and does not invite people to join into its fold, nor advocates, preaches, or supports any change of religion. However, if anybody is inclined to embrace this ideology, he or she is welcome. In short, it goes hand in hand with secular and intervened secular life intervened with the spiritual life. Sikhism is one of the youngest faiths among the major world religions. Some people describe Sikhism as a part and parcel of Bhakti movement of Indian subcontinent. However, it has a different, separate and independent ideology. Sikhism developed while the region was being ruled by the Islamic and Ibra Islamic era of Ibrahim Lodi, followed by Mughal period Babar to Bahadur Shah, and the Gurus ran concurrently. During such a long period, they had very amicable and cordial relations. It is interesting and important to note that the six being monotheist people and nearer to the fundamentals of Islam was exempted to pay jazia tax levied on the non-Muslim subjects of the Muslim ruler. But sometimes for a short while they had conflicts also due to different misunderstandings of the emperors by the misrepresentations of the Sikh movement by the people of vested interest who, pro who projected as Sikh growth of Sikhism is a threat to their authority and empire. Status of women. <clears throat> Nowhere else women are treated equal but here not only pleaded equality but established her supremacy. Musa posed an interesting question. Why when the when she gives birth to the kings and prophets and human race, nobody is born without a woman, then why call her bad or impure and debar her for certain days of a month for religious functioning due to her physiology. Only the creator God is without woman. For giving equal status, it has forbidden women for putting the veil. It prohibits marrying more than one woman or man and educated widow marriage if required by the individual at par with widowed men. It has strictly prohibited the ritual of sati, burning, on the, burning of the widow on the pairs of the husband. It has preached the equal treatment of the widows as other married women and that there should, no, there should not be any discrimination. I conclude 
to conclude, I say Sikhism has a potential to play a significant role in substantial growth of humanism. The Sikh places of worship, the Gurudwaras are the homes of Sri Guru Granth Sahib, the digest of interreligious and interfaith teachings of mankind. The holy book is in different colloquial spoken languages and in one Guru Mukhi script, it contains the teachings of revealed to the 36 contributors, among them are six Sikh Gurus, seven Muslims, two deemed to be untouchables and remaining from different sections of the Hindu traditions. It is the outcome of their personal experiments conducted during five centuries in the human laboratories from Hazrat Baba Sheikh Fai to Guru Tegh Bahadur. It gives the message of oneness of creator and oneness of creation about the barriers of religions, caste, creeds, high and low by birth or profession. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Ji, for that very presentation, in fact, for participants. Major, the creation of Sikhism was a major body blow to the pernicious system of uh, caste discrimination in the Hindu faith. The innovation of the langar of equal eating to break this pernicious system of caste discrimination was a major step uh, to bring forward the concept of equality in India. The other less known innovation which uh, has not been given enough credence even by Sikh academics is Maharaja Ranjit Singh, one of the greatest rulers that India has had, after becoming Maharaja the Raj, actually issued a hukumnama for the abolition of capital punishment in the 17th century, a long time before uh, we all thought about what it was. The hukumnama is still available in the archives now of the Punjab University and it's very interesting that uh, uh, people haven't done some uh, a PhD thesis or an MPhil thesis on how it evolved and how Ranjit Singh who was a very judicious king in the imparting of justice uh, uh, with a lot of common sense uh, is not being uh, entertained or adequately elucidated. I'll stop here. I will now throw open the floor to points of information, clarification, questions. Please be brief. Uh, don't get off into speeches. Make your points pithily and uh, concretely and concisely. And uh, please identify yourself for the minute takers. Thank you. It's always good to have a friend in the chair. <coughs> uh, uh, my question is to uh, you. In, in, in uh, an international system where it was discussed very briefly yesterday, many countries, including India, are signatories to the entire debut of conventions, covenants, and treaties and treaty bodies. But over a period of time, we have seen repeatedly a total defiance by the nation state, by member states, of any UN system. Even the Geneva Conventions which predate the UN are defied and disobeyed by just about everybody, including some of the giants of the world, the US and NATO. I'm just wondering if uh, there is any evolving thought on how to hold countries accountable. The European Court, the Criminal Court, one has been there. By the way, Indian, Indians who commit even genocide can't be punished. Only their visas can be revoked for a few years or a few months. Where do we really go from here? Those who are victims, nations who are victims, people who are victims, how does the UN mechanism 
enforce itself or, or do we believe like many believe now that it's over, it's just a club. Useful when it suits you, useless when it does not suit you, which is most of the time. I don't think it works. Okay, thank you, Mr. Chairman. I would like to concur with uh, Lorena's uh, analysis of the role of religious judges. Indeed, if we are to disqualify religious people from officiating as judges because of their beliefs and values, that's the greatest insult we can have towards the non-religious judges. It means that they don't have values whatsoever. And I do believe that people without values will never sit on the bench. This doesn't mean that a, that a judge, whether he's religious or not, is allowed to or, or will allow himself to try a case with a partiality or with bias. As the scriptures provides, with justice should you try your colleague, with justice and not with bias. I would like to take a minute to say something about the a Jewish law approach to the role of the judge, which may differ from a modern a legal systems. Uh, Talmud provides that a judge should try the case truly true. And this, this looks a bit amazing. What do you mean by truly true? How true should true be in order to be truly true? And the uh, Talmud explains it has to be true according to the evidence that was brought before the court, but it has to be true also according to objective reality. That's a very hard task. Any judge would agree with that. Uh, if we come over, we have one saying in the Talmud that may uh, fit the modern notion of a judiciary. The judge has no more than what his eyes see. On the other hand, the judge is ordered he cannot say, I will try the case according to the evidence that's brought before me, and any responsibility for injustice would lie on the, evi on the witnesses and not on me. And uh, moreover, Talmud says that a judge must deem as if a sharp sword is lying in front of him, and if he deviates one millimeter from justice or truth, he'll, he'll meet the, the, the sharp so, so he should be very worried about that. As a matter of fact, many of the greatest uh, Jewish rabbis refused to officiate as judges for the fear that they may inadvertently uh, carry, uh, have a uh, misjustice carried on. So that's, I would say, an interesting model that we may think about. that. I also uh, one thing that struck me in an interesting way that there's a tension between uh, the two parts of your paper that is uh, in a way the second part of the paper religion contributes to legitimacy or the, the religious values in the first part religion could result in uh, compromising impartiality. Uh, and I th just th thought that it might be interesting to, and I don't know if you have any th thoughts on this, I and mean, we have this interesting situation right now where of the eight judges, justices on our Supreme Court, there are five Catholics and three, three Jews. I mean, this is a, a quite a new development in American history, in which both of those groups were basically minorities, uh, but I mean, in some ways, I suspect most Americans haven't noticed, uh, and that's probably a very good thing. Uh, to some extent, given that judges are appointed, religious values or religious adherence may be a source of some predictability for the people who are trying to choose. That might be a source of bias part of why they're being chosen, I suppose, for political purposes. But it's interesting that the religious background is not really necessarily a predictor because you've got 
Well, you've got three of the conservative judges, Alito, Roberts, and Thomas, who are Catholic. But Sotomayor, who's on the other wing of the court, is Catholic. And Kennedy, who's the swing judge, is Catholic. The uh, justices, Breyer, Ginsburg, and Kagan, are probably more conservative on the liberal wing. But it's interesting that the religion factor uh, is does not, at least at that level, factor, although it's a, it is a predictor factor of which way they may vote. So anyway, let me comment on those. For reminding me, I have to be quick, but I'm not very obedient. Um, I'm not even in this. Um, um, thank you very much for your for your comments and your uh, very interesting um, questions. I would say, with regard to the to the first um, person who took the floor, I'm sorry, I, we don't know each other's names. Um, about the legitimation of the United Nations and the non-operative. Um, enforcement, a non-operative mechanism of international instruments and, and the lack of enforcement in, in certain areas, but uh, obviously this is a political institution. Um, I wouldn't be able to answer you what would be the solution, what would be the right approach. The perception is really um, in many countries that it's um, a club of powerful uh, countries that decide upon the others. But at least um, I think United Nations, and that this is a, a shortcoming of every international institu institution and in, in every international instrument is that they lack direct enforcement measures. I mean, um, this is based upon the agreement of the member states and the willingness of the member states, but there is no um, enforcement procedure per se. But uh, anyhow, um, I might agree in some way with you, but this is a general criticism. And at the end, um, anyone working in the international public law would tell you that even if it's not the best instrument or the, or the most efficient one, it's better to have it than not having it. So that, that was the approach also for, by the um, mm, nation society, the president of the United Nations, that it, at least it provides for a forum for discussion, at least visibility of certain, of certain arguments and certain problems in, in, in trying to cope with the global world. But obviously it's not a perfect system. I, I couldn't contribute much more and, and it would be a, a long discussion too and I'm not working in UN so I don't I can't I couldn't tell you about the insights and how they really is influenced or not by politics uh, regarding to Usher's um, intervention thank you for your comment and and it's really very interesting when we're approaching the topic of justice to see that uh, for example in in defining the concept of access to justice and fair trial rights most religions uh, have similar and provide similar standards. I was reading about the Sunnah and the Quran and uh, as the chap, uh, man, the chairperson said, um, they are very similar to those approved in, in Western societies through international conventions. So it's, it's very interesting to go back to this um, religious um, wisdom and religious documents to see that uh, what we are now really stems from wise people that thought that it was interesting to introduce those values in the society and also in, in solving conflicts by a third impartial person um, to provide certain peaceful coexistence in, within the society. So thank you very much. I'm, I'm, I'm not mastering the Talmud, but um, the idea of uh, finding the truth and the truth not only for you but for the general approaches it reminds me of that idea that in partial, uh, the judge has to be impartial but impartiality has also to be seen so in the idea that a third reasonable observer should also approve 
or consider that this is the right approach to solving a problem. And um, finally, we have always the problem of um, uh, coming to calls and remarks. Um, I might have been not very clear in, in the presentation. I, I really cut a lot on, on legitimacy. But my, my stance was that um, in, in the first part, uh, we, religion shouldn't be, per se, even if it's solid convictions and solid faith and a solid stance towards political, social um, reality, it shouldn't be viewed, per se, as an, as an element of bias, or as an element of prejudice for people who are not sharing the same faith as the judge, because um, the problem is not having those faith or having those beliefs, but having the non-ability or not being able to change mind and put yourself in the position of the others. So the history has shown that even having very strong religious approach, it does not impede you or impair you to approach in an impersonal way the um, trying of cases, but obviously that needs a very honest and a very um, high commitment of the person judge in order not feeling disobedient to his or her religion by um, by applying the the law, and that's the introduces the very interesting discussion I'm not uh, specialized in in how far in how far a judge should or could disqualify himself um, if he considers that his or her religious beliefs does not allow him to approach a case in a completely impartial way. Because uh, one of the oaths of the judges is, I will comply and respect the law and the constitution. But coming to certain cases which go beyond the constitution, which go uh, it's an interpretation of constitution that might be uh, against their own beliefs. There might be, um, and this is a very old and new question, because no judge has ever, in Spain at least, um, come up with the idea of, I'm unable to judge because I have strong religious beliefs that don't allow me to enter into this, this trying this case. But anyhow, there would be very, very many tiny issues to, to continue discussing on that. But my point was not that religion um, is a risk for impartiality, but not the ability to open your mind and really stick to the facts of the case. Obviously, in interpreting the law, the, your religious stance will always come, your, your worldwide philosophical approach. It's not a problem, although it's viewed as a problem. The, the second part on the legitimacy is not that religion legitimizes. My point is, if we want to foster um, religious freedom in a broad sense and as much as possible, then certain um, the idea of inclusive pluralism should be also reflected in the judiciary. And in the judiciary and its composition, and the way of selecting the judges, but also in every individual judge. If the judge is not convinced that that is the model to be followed and it's not able to really understand tolerance, then it will cause, I'm, I'm finishing already, it will cause that um, those minorities or a certain percentage of the population will not see the judiciary and the judicial function legitimate because they won't trust it and they will lose confidence and to prevent that to prevent that what would be the idea the idea or the solutions obviously fostering a um, recruitment of judges from very different um, religious beliefs or, or religious background ethnical background but not forcing it because then we would be infringing the equality principle in some way and second and second doing a lot of legal education and education in human rights for the judges. So if those two requirements are complied with, then there is more chance that judges don't um, maintain and retain this open-mindedness that is important for avoiding uh, discrimination. And avoiding discrimination will legitimate the judicial function.
and ju a judicial function, if it's legitimate, people will trust, and trusting will really avoid, Im improve the rule of law, and if there's a rule of law, there's less chances for, or more chances for peace and stability. That was my point. Thank you, Professor Victor. I have quick three interventions, and I think, I'm sorry, I'll have to cut it short because 